and welcome back to another episode of Sunday Sessions by the Macquarie University Liberal Club. I'm your host, Rory O'Connor, and I'm joined by my co-host, Andrew Crimmon. How are you? Rory, good to see you. Good to see you too, legend. Tonight's special guest is Gigi Foster, an economist at the University of New South Wales. How are you? Very well. Thank you for inviting me. Thank you for coming on the show this evening. Now, I realized that you have a new book that you were keen to talk about this evening. Is that right? I do. My co-authors and I have just published The Great COVID Panic. Uh, it's available on Amazon now and uh, hopefully we'll be launching uh, over the around the country over the next couple of months. Perfect, perfect. So I just want to let all our audience members know you can send your questions in the comments in Facebook Live and hopefully we'll get around to all of them this evening. So I think we'll get stuck right into it. So you recently co-authored that book, what happened, why, and what to do next, the great COVID pandemic. It's currently the number one bestseller in education research on Amazon. Could you tell us a little bit about your new book and why you think it's become so popular? Sure, Rory. First, I'll say that Amazon's categorizations are a mystery to me. This is not a book about education research, uh, although it was also number one in virology for a while. Um, it really is a broad-based social scientific treatise. So in The Great COVID Panic, my co-authors, Paul Friders and Michael Baker and I attempt to make sense of what has happened during the past 18 months or so, not just in Australia, but around the world, how we have gotten into this policy nightmare that we are in uh, and basically how much we've lost that we haven't recognized and built into our policy making and how importantly we can reconcile with what's happened, including within families, within professions and in our countries and move forward together. So it was really a very cathartic effort to, uh, to produce this book. I think the reason it's popular is really multifaceted. First, I mean, I have been talking about it a bit and I have probably been one of the, the lightning rods in this country uh, in terms of people who are prepared to go out in public and say that lockdowns were a bad response to COVID. And so if, if you have hate me or you love me, you might be interested in the book. So that might help. Um, the Brownstone Institute, our publisher in the United States has been pushing it very hard and it, it very much aligns with their mission, which is to try to understand how to install institutions and safeguard and nurture institutions in societies that preserve people's freedoms and, uh, and don't feature authoritarian overreach by governments. Although I should also add, although this is a liberal party event, I am not a member of the liberal party nor of any political party. As a professor, I very much uh, make a point of not belonging to or giving money to or support to any particular political party. Um, my aims are very much about human welfare and are not motivated by ideology. And that comes through very strongly in this book. It's also a, an orientation that is shared by both of my co-authors. So, uh, you know, we'll see how it runs. But uh, at the moment, as you say, signals seem to be good. And I'm getting a lot of invitations to speak on radio and television about the book as well. You'd be able to delve a little bit into the book for us. Sure. So we, we have a two pronged approach. Uh, on the one hand, we, we tell stories of what has happened during this period through the eyes of three main protagonists, the, the big players at an individual level of this period. Jane, James, and Jasmine, we call them. Jane is the fearful citizen who wants to be protected and scares easily and essentially has kept the madness going, first by pressuring her politicians to protect her in ways that were extreme and disproportionate to the actual threat because she was so afraid, she was paralyzed by her fear. And then even in the later period, so even in 2021, continuing not only to demand that protection, but indeed to punish others who said we didn't need that protection. So she has been part of the enforcement brigade, basically, of these disastrous wealth and health destroying policies that we've seen inflicted here in Australia and elsewhere. James is an opportunist. He is a, a person who sees advantage and opportunity whenever they arrive. And they certainly arrived in spades to him when most of the world got so scared of COVID and he could be seen as the provider of protection. James is both in government and in industry. There are James types in both of those places and often they will coordinate with each other. Governments will order huge masses of face masks or hand sanitizer. And uh, the companies that are headed by James are more than happy to provide those or vaccines in our most recent uh, sort of a wave of James's. Jasmine then is basically myself and my co-authors plus a good contingent of people around the world who have seen what is happening, initially expected things perhaps not to go so badly. I was certainly expecting the fear would, would wear off within the first couple of months, but then were surprised and horrified to see what happened and have been seeking 
first of all, confirmation that they were not the ones going insane, that the world was going insane. And so they've sanity checked with each other. And then some notion of why this has happened. So we tell those stories through um, personal experiences penned by indeed not just us, but other people who have been Jasmine's and, and uh, Jane's in this, in this period. But also um, we, we then have a much more rigorous scholarly component of the book as the second prong. And in that component, we look at the political economy aspects of why what has happened has happened, including that sort of James dynamic I spoke of. Um, also the social scientific aspect. There's a whole chapter devoted to crowds, for example, crowd herd behavior, which is something we really had not seen in social science for my generation. And so I think that's why a lot of us were not expecting it. So we dissect what a crowd dynamic really is and how we've gotten into this and how we might get out of it. And we speak about um, many other kind of uh, historical analogies. So the prohibition period in the United States, for example, um, and, and the Middle Ages as an example of the kind of feudalistic behavior that we now see in big businesses, which are what we call neo-feudalist. Uh, we talk about the uh, what we call the bullshit industry, uh, which is a whole layer of people who are not productive and essentially damaging um, the, the, the growth of their societies and how all of these different factors play in to, to make us vulnerable to the overreaction that we have seen. And then we conclude the book by providing some um, suggestions for how we might be able to improve our institutions moving forward to hopefully protect us better against the possibility of falling into such a disaster in future if a similar threat arises. I recently saw you on Q&A and it says here that you were quoted as saying, I reject the idea that it's life versus economy, it's lives versus lives. The economy is about lives. Could you please deconstruct what you mean by that? Sure. So many people on the street, um, particularly those who are not economists, but even some people who are, don't actually understand that human well-being, the longevity we've experienced um, in our generation and the, the happiness in our lives is actually undergirded and supported by a functioning, healthy economy. A, an economy which is not centrally planned, but one in which there is a, a free market mechanism that is undergirded by strong institutions. So you have a government, there is a role for government, but there is also uh, the requirement that the man on the spot, the person on the street who has access to market signals about demand for his product or uh, you know, other kinds of um, aspects of the context in which he's operating, is the person who is making decisions about where to invest and how to try to make something or whether to go into a particular market or how to consume indeed what kinds of products and, and where to buy them and all that. Um, and so when we, when we press pause on that massively wonderful economic system that is interdependent across not just regions of a country, but across countries and uh, you know, across families within the country, then we are basically preventing that, that system from delivering to us the very health and welfare that we so desire that we want and indeed that has propelled us into some of these crazy policies saying that we want to preserve life. We're not preserving life as it turns out with lockdowns. I in fact thought early on that surely there would be some life preserved on net when we go into lockdowns because otherwise, I mean, how could, how could we ever justify such a policy? But as it's happened, if you look over the past 18 months and you see the research that's been done on countries and areas that have gone into lockdown versus those that haven't, you can see that in fact, there's, there's no correlation. And this is something that we discuss at length in the book. Uh, if anything, the regions that went into lockdown have done worse on deaths than those who have not gone into lockdowns. So, so that, that fantasy that somehow the economy is a separate beast from human lives and livelihood and happiness and welfare and thriving and the things that we all can agree that we want in societies, that fiction has undergirded much of the, the myopia and, and misguided policy setting and, and even the pressure from populations on their politicians during this time. So it is always a question for a government, how many lives will I save with this policy versus how many lives will I save with, this, save with this policy? And it's not just lives per se in terms of the number, but the quality of those lives, quality adjusted life years is the currency often used. It's what I used in my submission to the Victorian parliament last year, which I think was pretty much ignored, uh, which essentially suggested a way forward in terms of how to produce a cost benefit analysis of lockdown policies. So basically, the so the narrative is getting in the way of the actual of the actual facts of the actual statistics. But because the narrative is popular, it ends up it ends up it ends up continuing. Um, and furthermore, we've got the funds to sort of you know to keep us locked down and um, and dependent upon the government. Um, 
you were you were named um, the 2019 Young Economist of the Year by the Economic Society of Australia. Um, you went to Yale for your BA. You've got a PhD in economics um, from the University of Maryland. You mentioned before that um, that the Victorian Parliament was not listening was not listening to you. Is there anyone in the government listening to your analysis and those of your co of your co-authors? Andrew, I, I wish I could say yes. I have been waiting for the phone to ring for over a month uh, now, hoping that, that it would after I've gave, given some, um, some information to the Australian Local Government Association um, a couple months ago. And indeed, I've been waiting really since last year uh, for somebody in government to call me, whether it's a state leader or in, from the Commonwealth. I, I think people know what I'm saying. People in the government know what I'm saying, but I think that they find it impossible politically to action. And I can tell you that it's not the case, as you might imagine from just you know, an outside observation, that the government didn't do any cost benefit analyses at all. I think that what has happened is that they did some, or they at least looked at the possible cost of lockdowns, but they realized how awful it looked and that they couldn't possibly release that information to the public and so they buried it. My colleague Adam Crichton, at, um, who's an economics correspondent at The Australian, who's now actually in Washington, lodged a Freedom of Information Act request asking the Commonwealth Treasury to release its documents about cost benefit analyses and they released the documents but they redacted every single piece of useful information. But it was very clear in those documents that they had you know, had a discussion about the costs to children, to businesses, to livelihood, et cetera. So I think so people know somehow, but this has become simply a political game. The tether to health protection went out the window more than a year ago. And, and we now are playing political football with people's lives. And I find that offensive in the extreme. And it is, it is a criminal betrayal by the politicians of, of the population of this country. On the point of why doesn't the counter narrative get any airtime or get very much airtime um, and, and get canceled? Right? I mean, I've been, I've been defamed on Twitter, even though I'm not even on Twitter. <laughs> Apparently my friends tell me that I've been defamed there and I've certainly had a, many a moniker thrown at me over the past 18 months that I, I wouldn't care to repeat in polite company. Um, it is partly this crowd dynamic. When people are possessed by an obsession, as they are when there is a crowd dynamic happening, they will spew all manner of vitriol on other people who are seen not to be upholding the narrative. We saw this in Hitler's Germany. We saw this in the witch hunts. Uh, we even saw this in Prohibition, where there's a particular obsession about something that everybody in the crowd is fixated upon. And it's, it's almost like a, a crowd um, uh, selection, you know, self-preservation dynamic that takes over. And these people begin to themselves care about the preservation of the crowd per se, rather than anything else that used to matter before the formation of the crowd. So I've said so many times, what happens to everything else that's important in life? I've never denied that COVID exists or that it's taking lives and uh, sure, but many other things are as well. <laughs> and, and indeed they are taking far more lives in this country than COVID has ever taken. And, and that kind of perspective is simply lost in the case of COVID. So I think people like me have simply felt the, the heat of the crowd dynamic at an individual level and a group level. And it has been a, a fantastical experience, educative experience for me as a social scientist to live through this and experience the effects. I'm very lucky to have a very supportive set of uh, friends and family. So I'm, I'm perfectly fine psychologically, but boy, has it been an interesting period. And we're very glad to hear that you're doing all way as well. I do have an audience question here. It says, can you please describe the bullshit industries you mentioned in the book? Sure. So these are industries which essentially are focused on uh, optics and image uh, rather than actual um, uh, innovation and productivity enhancement. And they range everything from uh, probably if you work in a, in a department in the government, you'll be have ex been exposed to something like a, an equity, diversity and inclusion department. Now, my mother was the first affirmative action officer at Carnegie Mellon University, so I do have my bona fides in the area of equal um, treatment and opportunity for people. And I absolutely believe that I'm a classic feminist and thinking that women are people, full stop. And all of the other types of people are people as well, full stop. But many of the actions of the equity, diversity and inclusion brigade over the past 10 years or so have actually ended up damaging the welfare of those people that they are intended to uh, supposedly promote the welfare of. And I'll give you an example. So uh, an employee, employer of mine that I will not name, name by, uh, by, by title, uh, had a policy at one stage that the number of citations in the media of its male and female academics needed to be the same. 
again, some EDI type goal, KPI, right? Now, if you think about it, the number of academics who are prepared to speak to the media, which would include myself, for example, um, is not necessarily gonna be equally balanced, male and female. There, in fact, in reality, are many more men um, at the higher levels in academia, levels D and E, associate professor and professor, who would be more likely to feel comfortable speaking to the media than there are women in those levels. And so if you require that there's an equal number of mentions in the media, what you are actually requiring is that every woman who speaks to the media speaks more to the media than every man, which takes more time away from her research and her education activities. And so not thinking through that sort of impact leads potentially to a policy which can be disruptive and damaging to the very group that you, you think that you are helping with such a policy. And that's not even by any means the worst. There are so many reams of forms, for example, now that we must fill out in order to do a very simple piece of research in the social sciences because of the overreach of ethics boards. Human research ethics boards and committees have, have just ballooned in this country all far beyond the brief and the mission that is outlined in our very good national statement on the conduct of human research in Australia. And, and that is a headwind on actual scientific advance. And many, many other examples within middle management all over the public and private sector are, are, are holding back not only the advancement of economies, but also the ability of, of leaders to tell what the truth is. So around, for example, Gladys Berejiklian or uh, Dan Andrews, there will be a coterie of sycophants who simply feed them what they want to hear, just as there was in medieval times in, in a court. Right? And that's, this is one of the analogies we draw in The Great COVID Panic, the book is that the king needs to know things in order to make decisions about you know, his subjects and how to, how to govern, but he will naturally, because of his power, attract a whole you know, legion of people whose interest is just political. They simply want to stay close to power, that's it. And they are not interested in the welfare of the king's dominions, uh, you know, the various people who he's responsible for. They simply want to stay in his good books. And so they will feed him information that uh, is very sus suspect. And everything that he says will be considered to be gold, right? This is a very dangerous position for a king to be in or indeed for a state premier to be in. And so I'm saying that the, that the king makers are not, are not presenting no, no really difficult situations um, to, to them that will actually have long-term uh, long benefits for the public. If I can ask, uh, do you believe a larger underclass is being created by these lockdowns? What would be the impact on Australia, um, even in the long term? Oh, there's no question that uh, an underclass has not only really not been created, we had it before, but it has expanded. And the disadvantage of those who were disadvantaged at the start of COVID has only gotten worse during this period. The policies we've seen have been extremely regressive. People like me who have secure, well, I hope secure jobs and health and happy families and good places to live, we've been fine. We've had money in the bank. It's been going up, right? I mean, I, I, my super is worth more than I ever thought it would possibly be worth, right? It's just ridiculous. And, and meanwhile, <laughs> who has suffered from this? It is the people who have lost their jobs, who have lost their ability to leave their houses, who are cramped into small apartments with children, whose relationships have broken down because of the stress, who have been consumed with fear and pelted with fear-mongering images, not only from the media, but from their own governments during this period. They have not been supported. They have been rejected from hospitals. Their schools have been closed. Their children have been forced into their homes. The, the development of their babies and toddlers has been delayed because of having to look at masks all the time instead of real human faces. It is a criminal tragedy, what we, what we have done to the most badly off in our societies. And, and that fact has just been missing from, from the policymaking. And I'm only speaking now about what's happened in Australia. Do not even get me started on what's happened in the developing world. There have been millions of people plunged further into poverty, plunged into starvation, children killed directly because of our policies in the developed world. Because of course, when we trade with the other countries in the world, we create jobs. And when we allow people to travel like doctors or um, you know, development economists or anybody else who may go over to a developing country and try to help in some way, uh, you know, usually that has some kind of impact. Uh, but during this period, the, the worldwide recession has brought India back probably 10 years in terms of its, its poverty. And, and that's just one country. So it has been just 
catastrophic in human terms, what's happened. Another audience question that we have here says, in terms of our recovery, what are going to be the long-term economic impacts of these lockdowns? Well, that's a great question. And I wish more of our political leaders were asking similar questions. Um, I've been particularly concerned about our children because they have the longest left to live. Um, and of course, when we disrupt their schooling, we are disrupting their ability to build what, what we call an economics, human capital, their skills and knowledge uh, and capacity to be productive and, and indeed happy when they reach adulthood in whatever occupation they choose. And, and that is something that you cannot simply make up for at a later time. Um, people have this imagining that somehow, you know, well, well, we'll all just have extra tutoring and so it'll work out. Well, the thing is that resources are scarce. And the fact that resources are scarce means that when you make up for something you've missed, you have to take those extra making up for resources from someplace else, right? So a dollar is a dollar is a dollar. You can't, you know, that doesn't grow on trees. And indeed, during this period, because of the reduction in GDP that we've had and that just the, the slowdown in economic activity, we're going to be able to spend less on everything else in the future. And don't forget the debt and right? how much we've gone into debt to finance these JobKeeper payments and all the other government supports. That, that payback of the debt is going to inevitably, for political reasons, if not accounting reasons, crowd out expenditure on every other line item that the government usually spends on in the future. So that means we're going to have less to spend on those extra tutoring programs or, or whatever else we could use to help our children. So that's, uh, that's just in the area of, of disrupted schooling. And I've published a paper like uh, I think it was in 2020, April 2020, about a very narrow uh, costing of that, uh, that damage, which was in terms of foregone wages of children. And even if you assume that online learning is 90% as effective as face-to-face -face learning, then at the point of wherever I was, I guess it was actually more like June in 2020, the lockdowns of, of, in terms of the school closures we'd seen to that point would imply at least 50 to $100 million lost in foregone wages for our children once they reach adulthood. Now that's a very, very low ball estimate because A, it's only about wages, B, it's assuming 90% effectivity of online learning, which I think is, a, is an overestimate. And C, it's not including any of the other effects on children of being deprived of the ability to, for example, play with their friends, uh, see other people as uh, welcoming and, 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 you know, possibly friendship material rather than scary and somebody they might catch a deadly bug from, uh, being able to go to their grandmother's house and give her a hug without feeling that maybe that action would cause her death. These are, these are horrible things to put our children through. And the withhold of physical contact is horribly damaging for children as well. So I worry particularly about the babies and the toddlers, again, as I mentioned before. Um, and, and I just, uh, I, I'm so, I feel so awful for these people. This was indeed, that despair was a large part of the motivation for writing the book. Um, so that's one long-term cost. Now, again, the other one that is probably the biggest, I would imagine, uh, that hasn't been considered in full by our policymakers during this period is the fact that we have such debt, we've spent so much on these supports that we are gonna have to not spend in the future as much as we otherwise would. I also think, we may have done some serious damage in terms of our international reputation, and that may um, depress tourism, education, uh, and, and sort of trade in various ways with the rest of the world. I mean, I'm seeing now media reports from overseas, admittedly mainly on places like Fox News, that are satirizing Australia very heavily. And people saying, gee, I thought Australia was a bunch of rough and ready, down to earth, you know, crocodile Dundee folks. Well, no, they're just a bunch of pansies, you know, that sort of thing. And, and that may stick around, you know, we've changed our, our brand. And I don't know what that's gonna do, but I, I don't think it's gonna be that good. And I think internally we may become more xenophobic and more uh, nationalistic in a way that's not positive. I think there is a way to be good, uh, have a positive pro-social nationalism or patriotism, but I think nationalism to the exclusion of the idea that diversity and um, innovation is a good thing is uh, damaging in the long run. If, if for the next, say five years the the concept the concept of prudence has been thrown out either by the media or by or by politicians you know no one is allowed to think um about you know about about potential um you know about about potential uh, future future things like uh like the upcoming move strain coming from i think it's from south africa that is apparently vaccine resistant i mean we, we've got things like this we could we could potentially go back into lockdowns um, um 
the dimensions of, of debate will refuse to allow people to question um, whether this is a good idea or not. And again, I can't see anyone in the media or in politics changing it, um, except well, perhaps Craig Kelly um, in the next five years. Um, what, you know, you know what, what happened, like, how, how do we get out of this? It, like, is there, is there in fact a game plan that has been written about or are people who are concerned about this sort of running around as if we're you know, building the Tower of Babel? Well, it's an excellent question, Andrew, and it's exactly the sort of question we should be asking. We, in what I've referred to elsewhere as the covistance or the resistance, the COVID resistance, um, it does feel a little bit like being under siege, doesn't it? Being censored and unable to think thoughts, right? It is like, it's very Orwellian. Um, and, and I've many times during this period, I've thought of myself, uh, you know, alternatively as sort of living through what, what um, Schindler is depicted to have lived through in, in the movie Schindler's List, or uh, indeed many of the other people who suffered in, in Vichy France, um, or someone in, in East Germany trying to get over to the West. Uh, I mean, it is, it is just dreadful. I think in terms of what will actually break the spell, one of the big things, and I, I, I love that this is possible, is that even though the media has connected us to the rest of the world and maybe had a damaging impact and exacerbated the problems over the last 18 months, nevertheless, the media does still connect us to the rest of the world now, and the rest of the world is moving ahead much faster than we are. And as we see ourselves being made fun of overseas, as we see people having parties in Florida or you know, going out and, and just having regular jobs and going to office buildings and, and whatnot in, in, in Texas or wherever, that will make us slowly realize, wait a minute, I, I, I wanna have that, right? That jealousy, that, that envy for what the other has, the grass is always greener sort of scenario, that is a very powerful force. And, and I think ultimately that's going to be a very big part of what kicks us out of this dystopian nightmare that we've been possessed with. I also think, and of course we go in uh, to detail in the book about the specific institutional changes that we think would be important. And those have to do with also increasing um, direct democracy and uh, incentives and, and sort of institutional supports for direct democracy. But I think it will be important to go to particular professions where there are alignments of, so we say jasmines in those professions, people who have been skeptical of the policy response and ask them, find, find what they have been thinking, what needs to change in this area. Ask the lawyers, look, what, where have we fallen down? What are the, what are the laws that have, that have you know, been overwritten in the past five years and need to be uh, reconsidered now? Or how can we overturn, how can we set precedent in some way so that this no longer happens again? Um, same thing with economists, with uh, psychologists, with anybody in the, in the ministries who can see, okay, here is how we fell over during this period, and here is how we could maybe move forward in my profession, in my little neck of the woods. Because, you know, I, or the three of us who write this book, we are only three people, right? And, and one of the lessons of economics, if you ever pay attention to it, is that diversity and, uh, you know, multiple views is the way that you move forward as an economy and, and as a society. So we need to listen to what people, the most potent resource we have, are saying as they wake up and as they realize, okay, I am needed now to push my economy and my society forward into a better future. Um, no one person can do that. No one government can do that. That's what's called central planning, right? That doesn't work. We need to outsource and, dis and, and disseminate and, and sort of enable multiple voices to be heard during the recovery period and, and listen to them and, and hopefully take their advice in our rebuilding of our institutions. But, but in, in the instance of say, when we finally get that strain where, it's, where, it, where it is vaccine resistant, they realize it is vaccine resistant. You've mentioned that, you know, we could potentially open up because everyone else is judging us. Well, what if everyone decides to behave like a crowd and lock and lock down and lock down at the same time, and so no one seems mad. Well, I mean, the evidence that I'm seeing coming out now from the countries that vaccinated the earliest, like Israel, um, and even now from the UK, is indicating that the vaccinations are not providing the you know the, the perfect solution that some people hoped that they would. They were never going to anyway. They were never going to be a silver bullet solution. And while they do seem to prevent. Um, or not prevent, but lessen the likelihood of serious disease and death in the most vulnerable populations. And so I think, you know, should be considered by, by people and their GPs who are in those vulnerable groups. Um, natural immunity is simply superior. And, and what I was saying last year is just still true. The more we prevent the virus from coming in, 
to Australia, the more we are kicking the can down the road. We are preventing the emergence of herd immunity, actually. And if you look at Sweden, which is a country everyone loved to hate last year, uh, Sweden actually is completely over COVID. You know, they, they did lose about 14 or 15 million uh, thousand people from their country. And that's not a, not a small number. And, uh, you know, they, they did mess up a bit early on with the, how they were handling the aged care facilities. But to their great credit and to Andres Tegnell's great credit, um, they have pulled through and they now have a level of immunity, it seems, that outstrips pretty much any area in the world. And so their economy is open and everything is fine. And they will continue to be like that, I think. They are not going to slip back into uh, you know, a, a lockdown situation, unless of course, the next strain, you know, whatever mutant variety it is, uh, is exceptionally lethal and killing the kids and things like this. I mean, one of the great fallacies of this period has been that COVID is actually in a league with the, the most potent and infamous viruses of history, such as the Spanish flu. It simply is not, it simply is not, right? That is it, it's just not a reasonable comparison. If you look at the fatality rates and the, the types of people that it was killing, um, COVID ruthlessly uh, prioritizes uh, in terms of its incidence of symptoms and death, the people who are the weakest in the society. And it's that's physically the weakest, that's just the reality. It, it preys on people who are immunocompromised, particularly the older, people who are obese, people who have comorbidities, that's, that's what it, it focuses on. And so, you know, unless this, this virus mutates hugely to become something that really is dangerous to the young and the, the people who are of working age, then Sweden will not capitulate, I don't think. Um, and, and I might just add finally that when a virus like this emerges, coronavirus, typically what we see is the emergence of new strains, of course, and those strains tend to move in the direction of being more transmissible and less lethal. And that is because of the evolutionary interests of the virus, right? A virus does well when it doesn't actually kill off its host because then the host isn't walking around able to spread it anymore, right? They, it wants to infect the host and make them maybe feel a little bit ill, but not that ill uh, because they wanna be able, the virus wants that person to keep being able to walk around and infect other people. And so the most successful variants uh, and those therefore that will emerge as mutants uh, are the ones that will be more infective like Delta and less lethal. Also, it seems like Delta, Delta. So I would expect this new variant to probably be more likely to have those characteristics and to be even more lethal. Some of the stats we have here from the team is that over the COVID period, the inflation rate has gone from 1.1% to 3.8%. We do have a few audience questions related to inflation. So my question was, do you think we should be concerned about the increasing inflation rate? I am worried about that a bit, yes. Um, and I even asked a question of, I think it was Guy DeBell last year in one of the RBA's briefings, you know, are you worried about stagflation? Stagflation is something we had in the 1970s, as you may remember. I, I don't actually remember myself, but um, in the mid 70s in the US, the inflation rate was, you know, astronomical. And my grandmother, as it happens, uh, happened to be lucky and realized, oh, I'll buy some zero coupon bonds during this period. And she bought them in something like, you know, 76, 77, 78. That's what put me through university, the returns on those bonds. <laughs> so thank you, grandma. But that's not what we want uh, in general, right, for a society. And, and what stagflation is, is stagnation of economic activity combined with inflation. And that is exactly the sort of thing I was worried about then. I still am worried about even more now. Now, Guy Debell pretty much, you know, uh, rejected by my question is anything reasonable at all um, at the time. But what we want is to get the level of economic activity back to be more commensurate with the amount of money circulating, because that's the key problem, right? You want the money, the amount of money around in people's, you know, bank accounts and, and sort of liquid in people's pockets to be roughly what is needed to support the economic activity that's happening. And at the moment, I, I worry about, you know, this is coming up too, too high relative to this. And so I want us to get back to economic activity as quickly as possible so we can kind of take up some of that extra money. Now, one thing that has been protecting Australia, which I had not foreseen, is that because we have trapped all of the people in Australia, including the rich people, um, and because they really like to spend, it turns out, 
they've actually continued to spend on various things, home improvement, new cars, you know, redo the vanity, whatever. And that has really helped some industries in Australia to continue to operate despite the lockdowns. They've been uh, nominated as essential industries or whatnot, and, and they've been able to continue to go. And I believe that that sort of spending of, of trapped people, people trapped in Australia, who would otherwise have been going overseas and plonking money you know, in Greece or someplace, that has been a large part of what's propped up our GDP. Um, and if we were to, you know, open the borders, then of course those people would, including me, would flow out <laughs> quite quickly to take vacations that have been pent up for a while. And so I think we would see a hit to our GDP. So I am worried about inflation, but I, I'm, I'm not as worried, I suppose, as, uh, as maybe some of your audience members. Why are home prices currently soaring? I, I've personally found it difficult to get, because, you know, I've had some, some issues with, with my jobs. Um, and I found that moving to places that I previously thought were cheaper areas are now more expensive than where I'm currently living. Yeah, there's a few things going on there. And I would say I'm not the world's expert on this. Uh, I would refer you if you're interested to what Cameron Murray has said. He's a, an excellent housing markets uh, an analyst. He's up in Brisbane. Um, and in fact, we had him on my radio program a few weeks back talking exactly about this. The radio program is The Economist on ABC Radio National. Um, and basically, there are a few things going on. One is, again, those rich people. They got this money, what are they going to do with it? And maybe they're going to buy a new house and maybe they're going to, you know, renovate another one and then try to sell that one. And so there is an activity going on in that in that sort of upper uh, echelon of the housing market. Um, and another thing that's happening is, and this has happened for a while, something Cameron talks about, is that the people who develop properties, the property developers, uh, do not release all the property that is sort of available and could be released to the market all in one fell swoop because that would depress prices and that's not in their interests, right? And so there's a kind of a, of a, of a siphoning off of, you know, one at a time or, you know, a few at a time to the market rather than actually putting new housing on the market in a glut. So that kind of intermediation, I suppose, of the property developers is also part of what may explain that. Um, and you know, otherwise, I think we've we've tried to encourage um, house buying, even by people who aren't really prepared to buy houses. For example, there was that two percent down um, initiative for I think single mothers that that uh, the government announced. Uh, I don't know if it was last year sometime, which I was not in favor of because I, I believe as much as I, I sympathize with single mothers and their position, I don't think this is the way to help them. This is a way to let them in for a, a financial situation they are not prepared to be able to shoulder, particularly if interest rates start rising. Uh, and so that will, of course, encourage you know, more purchases and, and, of course, through the loss of supply and demand for prices to rise. So uh, I think those things, and maybe just finally, there has been a shift to areas that are not traditional areas, and maybe some of the places you've been looking, Andrew, are maybe in the regions. And of course, because of Zoom, Zooming and uh, working from home, living in uh, someplace like Newcastle becomes a lot more possible than it used to for someone who's working in Sydney. And so that may put some additional upward pressure on the prices of, uh, of homes outside the CBD. We have another audience question here. It says, uh, lockdowns, in spite of your arguments, are still popular with many people. Are you saying that the majority of people who support the lockdowns have been influenced by the, the fear of the media? Oh, absolutely. Would anybody claim during this period that that's not true? I, I just think that's very obvious, yes. And, uh, and I think we've been schooled to swallow various narratives that have been put to us in succession. The most recent narrative is, oh, you can get your freedoms back if you get vaccinated. Now, put this in perspective. This is a medical procedure on which we do not have long-term safety data. Uh, which is perhaps advisable for some of the more vulnerable in our communities, but probably not advisable for the young for whom, um, you know, if you're healthy, the COVID virus is pretty much the least of your health worries. You're much more likely to die in a car crash or by, you know, some random other thing that happens to you while you're out drunk uh, than you are to die of COVID. And indeed, it may be that because of the short-term side effects even, um, it's, it's killing children to require vaccination of children against COVID compared to a scenario in which you let them get naturally exposed to it. Now, if you say this, most people in Australia today will think that you are literally out to kill their children. <laughs> they just have swallowed this narrative that vaccination is actually the right thing to do, not just for yourself, but for others because it protects others. Well, again, on that point, Vaccination does seem to provide protection against symptoms and death uh, for the person vaccinated, but you actually have just as much of the virus in your nose if you're vaccinated than if you're not vaccinated, it turns out, according to studies. And if that's true, 
then, and you're more likely to be walking around because you're less likely to have symptoms because you've been vaccinated, then you're actually more likely to spread it, right? So my, my current reading of the data is actually that being vaccinated is, is the more selfish choice in the sense that you are caving into your own fear. And if you're young and healthy, it's actually, ironically, not good for you, even though you, it is sort of a selfish choice. Um, because you're exposing other people to um, more of the virus that'll be in your nose while you're walking around not having symptoms. Um, but, you know, it may actually end up causing more damage to you uh, than, than it would if you just got the virus naturally. So that kind of narrative saying, well, if we just get vaccinated, then we can open up the country is just completely foreign. If you were to tell us that this would be our choice two years ago, people would laugh you out of the room. You know, freedom is something we have in this country. We have a right to. We don't have to go through a medical procedure in order to get it. And the idea that vaccination as a choice should be politicized is just anathema. So uh, yeah, these things have been accepted just you know, hook, line, and sinker by people who have been possessed by this proud ideology. And uh, you know, the more we can satirize it and try to bring perspective, um, as I've been trying to do, I think the better. We have another question. Is there research into lockdown-related deaths? Yes, definitely. Um, we review this quite a lot in our, in our upcoming book, The Great COVID Panic. There are some areas in which in the short run, deaths go down during lockdowns. And that will include, for example, because people don't take their cars out as much, there aren't as many car accidents. And also because elective surgeries don't go ahead as much, there are fewer deaths on the table because sadly, some of those elective surgeries do end in death. Um, and some people thought early on that there might be fewer deaths due to environmental pollution. But it turns out that's not actually really bearing it bearing out because people do end up, in fact, using their cars more than they use public public transport when they do go out because they're afraid of using public transport because they're going to encounter other people. And so there is actually not, you know, not as much of an effect on pollution as we thought there would be. Um, and of course, the big categories of short term costs, uh, short term deaths that um, are coming out of the media now are in relation to uh, suicides. And, and you know, the mental health damage, of course, is, is a massive category of costs, which is really gonna, gonna manifest more in the future than it does uh, today. And, uh, and that will, you know, of course, create more deaths in the future. We are also crowding out healthcare for many other things. And we've already seen the effects of that in the mortality statistics by cause of death. When you look at dementia and um, cancer, those deaths are higher than they normally are. And uh, that jives with my understanding of what we have done, which is we have deprived elderly people who are suffering from dementia of the kind of social contact and support that helps to slow down the progression of the disease. I know this very well, my mother had dementia. Um, and, and also in cancer, you know, you need to early screen in order to catch many cancers. And when you don't, you, you end up, you know, unable to treat them as effectively. And so we've lost more people to cancer than we otherwise would have. So those are two very kind of short run um, pieces of evidence, I guess, that we have lost more people to these lockdowns in those particular areas. Now, in the longer run, the question is really always, you know, have we, have we lost more in total, including in the longer run? And you know, I think we will have um, once we add up all of the deaths, but it isn't numbers of deaths that usually guide policy. It is, as I say, as I said before, quality adjusted life years. So the suffering of someone who was locked in their home, lonely and unable to socialize should count in our calculus about what is the right policy. That suffering should count. It is part of the human experience. We are always and forever saving lives but life years rather than whole lives, right? So it's, it's, a, it's a question of, you know, a quality of a life and, and how many years of, the, of that life have we actually preserved? So I, I do think that, you know, in, in aggregate, and again, we go through this in the book, um, lockdowns have not saved lives uh, or, or quality adjusted life years, um, but they have in certain uh, categories looked to have a positive impact in the short run. A again, going back to the, the vehicular uh, things. And of course, in Australia, COVID deaths, right? Um, the locking away of, of Australia from the rest of the world has been the big uh, policy relevant action that has helped to uh, reduce COVID deaths compared to what we otherwise would have had. But of course, there are many other factors that have had nothing to do with policy that have made us luck out in terms of the number of, of COVID deaths that we've had. I am aware that we only have about eight minutes left, but hopefully we can squeeze in a few more questions. Since this is for university students, one of the questions here is where and what would be some good scholarly sources for students and people in general to go to in order to understand the effects of lockdowns? Well, uh, there's a burgeoning literature on this and uh, I actually have a, a mailing list 
called Voices Against Lockdowns that I've been um, sending material to for the past a little over a year. If anybody would like to join that mailing list, just email me. And uh, that has a lot of references to the academic literature um, and also the, the popular um, science literature about the cost of lockdowns and the best research that I've vetted that I think is uh, worthy. Um, again, you know, my, my book, The Great COVID Panic, that's the place you can go. All of chapter five is all about the, the tragedy that we have brought upon ourselves, including the cost of lockdowns and shelter in place orders. Um, and, you know, you can just go on to your, um, your university library and start searching for what, what people have said about lockdown costs. The National Bureau of Economic Research has come out with a couple of papers uh, recently about sort of surveying the cost of lockdowns around the world. Um, the Great Barrington Declaration people have some good information, and there's so many other uh, collections of pockets of resistance, you might say, around the world who uh, have websites where you can go to get a good uh, reading. But I think probably my, my mailing list is perhaps the thing I would suggest most. Thank you for that. We've, we've got another audience question from Adrian. What do you make of universal basic income, and do you think it could mitigate some of the economic issues within the pandemic? Ha. Huh. Interesting, universal basic income, the idea that never dies. Um, I would encourage your listener to look up the discussion that I had with a couple of other people in Brisbane um, for the Brisbane Dialogues group. I think it was about in 2018 or 2019 on universal basic income. My position on it is that politically it is dead on arrival because it is way too expensive. That is the basic position. Um, and a second thing I would say is that actually what universal basic income targets is the provision of a, a minimum threshold of support for every, every human in the, in the country. That is actually effectively what we try to provide with our current tax and transfer system. We target assistance to the people who need it at the time in their life when they need it. That's the idea. Now, there may be problems getting that assistance to them. That's absolutely true. But that is a problem that has a different solution than universal basic income, which again, I speak about in the, in the UBI talk with the Brisbane Dialogues. Uh, I could go on about this for a long time, actually. I've written on the conversation about it. Um, but the, the basic point is that we are, there are other ways that we should, I think, be attempting to help those who are the most disadvantaged in our communities, other than uh, what I believe would be a regressive move away from targeted tax and transfers into a universal system where even Gina Reinhardt gets $20,000 a year. I have, a, um, I have another question regarding, you, you said that you've been waiting for someone to call you um, for like the like past month or so um, in, regard, in regards to you know, more, more sensible economic choices. Um, what would you think about having you know, some, some sort of group um, that sort of, you know, you know some change.org um, you know, petition or something like that, um, that, no, that, would, no, that would assist getting your, getting your message out there and, and ho hopefully open up the economy. Look, I would support any and all such initiatives. I think that that idea is great. I've signed a number of parliamentary petitions during this period. Um, I, I encourage everyone to, to become an activist in, in whatever area you feel comfortable and able to. In fact, through that Voices Against Lockdowns mailing list, I've helped to coordinate uh, multiple different people who uh, have wanted to embark on some initiative. And I've said, look, if you're interested in this, please contact these people, right? So I see myself as a bit of a kind of contact maker. Um, the reality is that I also have a full-time job. So uh, I cannot be the person to do all of these things. I feel like I have a comparative advantage in certain areas and others will have other comparative advantages. And I absolutely wish to work with those who are, are, are of like, like mind. I have already been called to be expert witness on multiple different legal cases, which are in progress, class action suits against the, the criminal politicians of this period. Um, but yeah, in terms of trying to influence policy, look, I'm open to suggestions. I, I would love to work with people and I encourage everyone to, to see yourself as an agent of change during this period. We need you. So we're coming to the last couple of minutes now. So what I wanted to ask of you, Gigi, was, was there any uh, kind of last closing remarks you want to provide to any of the students? I guess I would like to encourage people to uh, be hopeful for the future and to try to meet the people who don't agree with them and engage with those people as openly and as compassionately as you possibly can. I have personally experienced cancellation attempts by people who I have thought for years were good friends during this period. Um, my children have experienced the same. Um, some of my good friends have experienced the same and it's tragic when that happens. So do not be the person who does that to someone else. When you encounter someone who is possessed still by this horrific narrative, um, try to be open and compassionate and meet them where they are, try to provide gentle encouragement to open their minds. Uh, try not to be too confronting. Uh, sometimes too much confrontation will just lead to more backlash. 
Uh, of course, in some moments, you, you have to just stand your ground and, and say, look, I, I don't accept that. That's not okay. But, um, you know, trying to provide the message that the person that you're looking at needs to, to hear. Um, that's what I would encourage people to do. So compassion is, is highly underrated during this period. It's been nearly absent from, from many public debates. And we want a society which, has, which features open and respectful engagement across the political spectrum and across the ideological divides um, that, that are featured in our society. And again, you can be part of that change by, by opening yourself to engagement with people that you, know, you think are crazy. Well, again, I'd like to thank you so much for coming on the show this evening. It's been fantastic to have you. Thank you very much for the opportunity. No worries. So I've been your host, Rory O'Connor. My co-host has been Andrew Brennan. This has been the Macquarie University Liberal Club Sunday Sessions. Thank you so much.